Hi, this is Richard Napier of the Siebel Hub. It's October the 5th, and I'm in San Francisco, and as has become in the space of a few years, I hope at least, a tradition, uh, George Jacob has graciously agreed to sit down in another dusty room with me and discuss the high points of open world, but also some of the key things that have been going on in the Siebel ecosystem over the last 12 months. George, thanks very much for coming along. Always a pleasure. Uh, you've noticed that, that the room is getting smaller, so next year we'll be doing this in an elevator. Um, sorry about that, George. Um, so I think that people who haven't been able to come to Open World um, are always aware that there are big themes, big ideas, big concepts that show up, or shall we say get airtime. Uh, what for you, George, has been, from a Siebel perspective, the, the real high point of Open World this year? a couple of things. I think one, there's a lot of excitement of, around Innovation Pack 17. Um, and we just released it at the end of July, so it's still finding its way into our customers' hands. We had a, an oversubscribed beta program, so that was already an indication that uh, uh, we hadn't had one uh, that size since, I think, five years ago when we first released OpenUI. Hmm. So there's already a sense that IP17 is as big not bigger for Siebel with the zero downtime, really. Um, and then the second is, uh, of course, that, that drew a lot of people to open world, so we felt like attendance in general was, uh, uh, was high. We had uh, over uh, 100 people um, who registered for our cab event on Sunday. Uh, we only had room, unfortunately, for 70, so we had to turn some down. Mm. Thank you, by the way, for letting the Siebel, well, Alex in the form of the Siebel Hub yeah. take part in that. I really well, appreciate it. It was that. really great having having Alex there and having you guys there through the week as always. Um, I think the other thing is we, from our perspective, are now having put 17 in a foundation uh, uh, going forward in place, uh, have pivoted heavily towards data and in various forms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. We see data as being frequently the biggest value in various forms um, of, of SQL installations for our customers. So there's the application itself, but there's a lot of data in, in our customer systems um, approaching petabytes in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking to tap into that data now that we have the foundation and the uh, user interface framework uh, mostly in place from our perspective. Well, just to, to come back to what you were talking about, data and the fact that even as a consumer, I'm aware that there's probably terabytes of data uh, just about me sitting somewhere in the cloud. Um, some of the, 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 the well, I hate to use buzzwords, but some of the themes that come back in relation to data is one that's cropped up a couple of times this year, indeed in some of your presentations, has been this notion of autonomous CRM as a kind of light on the horizon when we talk about uh, the Siebel roadmap, we'll often see that the vision of how CRM operates today is very different how, to how we think CRM will operate in 2025 or whatever. What exactly, what exactly does our autonomous CRM mean in concrete terms? Sure. I think actually we've been using the phrase, and actually we've been using autonomous CX, so customer ah. experience, so distinguishing between what the customer experience is and perhaps the relationship that exists between the people, say an employee or a partner for, on behalf of the organization and the customer at the, at the other end. So it's really the customer experience. And as we've seen over the years, and this has been playing out in, in front of us for 20 years, a transition from person-to-person -person interaction between an employee and a customer or an employee and a partner or a partner and a customer, which is really where Siebel grew up. Um, to what people call the digital transformation, which is frequently a self-service mm -hmm. experience between a person, usually the customer, and hence customer experience, uh, and a machine. And that first came in the form of the web, but then mobile applications, but in both cases, it's really the customer or a partner or even an employee interacting with an application. There's no person on the other side. Um, to what we are starting to see transition into two interaction channels 
One is, is actually, ironically, a heavily person-to-person -person channel, which is the social channel. But the number of interactions in the social channels um, are so many that no organization can put people um, to, to track. Right. So that's not enough interns to go around to do the social track. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what most people have done, or what early on what people did for the social channels is take the best and the, the worst, and focus on the top customers yeah. and the ones that were flaming about you the loudest. Um, but I think over, and, and that's probably at least five years old, or at least maybe even more than five years old in terms of that response. Yeah. But most of us have realized that you really need an automatic filtering system, maybe the first steps towards uh, what we're calling a machine-to-machine -machine interaction, an automatic application on behalf of the organization who's listening into these public conversations and then determining whether it can act or in most cases yeah. coming back to the organization and saying, hey, this is something that you should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So there's the social channel, which is a person-to-person -person channel, but in terms of the customer experience, is mostly a machine-to-machine -machine interaction. Customers not talking directly to the organization, uh, and nor vice versa. And then finally, there's this thing called Internet of Things that uh, you know, we've, there's a lot of buzz around. It has been probably for, again, at least a couple of years. Um, but it also demands of us um, an, an automated response. So we've been talking about the automation imperative, the need to automate interactions, which as humans we can, we can react to, and uh, in the moment our, our programs, our machines are not yet that sophisticated. And that's the journey that we've seen ourselves going on. So we coined the phrase autonomous CX to vaguely define that, uh, that nirvana, if you will, from the, where, um, where we need to go as an enterprise application in this space. Um, the opportunity from a business perspective is that uh, given that there are so many more interactions, there's, one can always read what uh, I think the uh, Eloqua folks call the digital body language. Um, and if you're smart enough, if your applications are smart enough, you can then provide a much higher degree of customer service, you're much more customer aware, so where the, the, the thing that I like to call out is where a person-to-person -person interaction may happen once a year between a, a customer and organization. Self-service web interactions you know, frequently happen, let's say, once a month or yeah. maybe even more. Mobile interactions seem to have, go up another order of magnitude, and it seems like because it's, it's in our hands, in our, in our purses, um, that you, we have maybe 10 interactions a month. But once you start thinking about when you speak about a product or a service to one of your friends, or even when your phone or you know, your fitness device or your car or refrigerator or TV or whatever your favorite <laughs> uh, Internet of Things example is, starts sending signals on your behalf, those things happen, you know, I'd say thousands, but I, I, I shouted to say that because it could happen millions of times. A day. And so there's an opportunity, there's a lot more data that ideally as a consumer, as a customer, I would like an organization to read that data, not, not share it perhaps with the rest of the world, but know based on that, me as well as my corner uh, grocer or barber or, or whatever it is in the old days. Right? That was the, that's the nirvana for customer experience, customer satisfaction. Yeah. I like the uh, the link to how we used to function in the past. Yeah. Um, well, and just just as an aside, we had back uh, maybe fifteen years ago at Siebel advertisements that essentially touted customer satisfaction in those terms because it's something yes. that we all uh, understand. I hate person. to say, but I remember. <laughs> yeah, I did. Very true. Yeah. Now, there's no doubt. I think, from my own personal experience, but also from talking to the the Siebel community here is that Siebel IP 2017 was a really groundbreaking and probably one of the most ambitious projects that's been around for a while in the Siebel world. 17 is an interesting number because 18 is an important age. When you're 18, you get the keys to the door, you get allowed to do a lot more fun things, at least where I come from, that's the case. So I have to ask, George, 17 was interesting, but 
what's the stuff that's coming out? There must be something really. Oh. Tell us a little bit about what's <laughs> on the horizon for well, AT. Well, I love that because I think what you just planted in my head is the end. So it sort of goes along with autonomous CX is self driving. Oh, right. <laughs> that's what happens at AT. True, true, <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, so I think that's a lot of having laid the foundation in 17 for what we think comes right. next. In 18, we're pointing at data, as you might expect, and trying to figure out how to make Siebel self-driving ultimately application mm -hmm. and so we looked at the, uh, the CRM data the business data and accounts uh, opportunities activities orders and we said what's the best way uh, to make that available to someone who's, who logs into the system so that it can inform their actions mm -hmm. as they come in and one yeah. of the things we've seen with open UI is a lot of our customers start to build out dashboards yeah and what these dashboards were doing was essentially starting to surface the forest from the trees. You, know, you have lots of lists and forms and lots of records, but the dashboards really call out the high points in the data. So that's one form of data that we're starting to tap into, and we focus in particular on allowing someone to build dashboards quickly. Mm. In 18, we really pointed at a lot of at the developer right now. And look, we looked at what it would take to build, for example, an infolet mm -hmm. that says this is the number of open opportunities I have. As a quick aside, yeah. an infolet is, is an official term for a new kind of visualization, essentially. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It gives you, it's a small, hence the let, mm -hmm. uh, bit of information. Mm -hmm. And we're, it's, we're all used to, you know, when we, we turn on, let's say, WhatsApp, having a little count mm -hmm. on how many messages have come in since the last time we read. Okay. So it's that, that sort of thing. Um, and we looked at what the development experience was for that because we, we started seeing it surface in some of the dashboards mm -hmm. that our customers are putting together uh, with OpenUI. And I think depending on what your metric is, I feel like we have the makings of, an, of a five to ten times improvement, meaning five times less or ten times less mm -hmm. the number of key uh, keystrokes or different uh, repository objects or whatever that you're working with. So that's our first step. We took something that I think we, we said at, at one level would take 30 steps and it's down to three and on the road to zero. Mm -hmm. We would like it, you know, an infolet to pop up based on usage ultimately. Um, but we can be already seeing by, by using both the metadata, our knowledge of the metadata, um, and the, the key information that we think is important to the user, an opportunity to improve that process. So in, in itself, it will manifest uh, first to, as an improvement in usability for the developer, mm -hmm. next, we believe, to the end user of the application, and then finally, uh, you know, there will be no, ideally, no uh, work required what will we do? There'll be no work required. I'm well, sure there'll, there'll be something. Be, yeah. and there'll be all sorts of other work required yes. dealing with the insights that the data is giving us. Uh, but we won't spend ourselves our mm -hmm. time you know, building these infolets or the or, mm -hmm. um, sort of expressing our our interest in them yeah. from a, a, a customer's mm -hmm. perspective. Well, I think I've got time for one more question. It's not so much a question as just a um, one of the things that I noticed personally in Open World this year was uh, there were a number of different approaches to how sessions should work. Uh, for example, uh, gone were the traditional pack them in a room and give them a hundred slides, uh, although there were plenty of those and there's a place for those. <laughs> Indeed, yours, George, was packed to the rafters, I have to say. Um, but we had flipped sessions, we had, you know, uh, true, we sort of, you know, hands on was very much more a, a part of this. And I've noticed. As, a, as an outsider, that there's a there's a movement towards more engagement uh, in those sessions, and I think it also reflects in the road shows that you've been running, uh, which, it, although you know, I never get to go to them. Um, hint, hint, George. Um, <laughs> the feedback, yeah, the, 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 you're welcome. The, the the feedback what I've got is that they've been tremendously successful. They've been an exercise in listening as much as talking, which is, I think, 
uh, a very big thing for a small community like Siebel to feel that it's lis listened to. So um, I know that there's a couple more planned in the, the current series of roadshows. I think there's one in Utrecht and one in London coming up. Are there plans to carry on with that system and essentially give you your round-the-world plane ticket again? And Because you must have covered all of the continents. Are they going to happen again in 2018? Absolutely. We went from doing about eight uh, events in 2016 mm -hmm. to... Um, our count right now as of the one that we did on Sunday this week is 22 completed in 2017 with, I've been saying four all week, but I just realized we added a fifth. So next week we're, talk, we're looking at Washington, Seattle, and Toronto. We just added Seattle. Uh, and then as you mentioned, London and Utrecht. So we'll be up at 27 in the calendar year of 2017. And, uh, um, I think all expectations, the, the response has been very positive. Our, our learnings from the roadshows have been very positive. They've informed our product roadmap as we've gone through the year. Um, and so our expectation is we will, uh, you know, everything else staying the same, look to do something like uh, that same number, mm, 20 good. to 30 in uh, 2018. Mm. I'm certainly, I, from the feedback I would be getting, uh, I would encourage the, the Siebel community to watch the, the, the page where John usually publishes the list of upcoming uh, events, yeah. but also obviously on events.oracle.com, um, to really get engaged, because it's a fantastic way, you know, they actually listen, is what somebody said to me. They, 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 it's not just an exercise implicating, as you say, <laughs> the flame war and the thinking, right, uh, one fire is put out and I can move on. The, these conversations do actually keep there's, there's a circuit established, it's not just a one-off. And I think that is, in a, in a community like Siebel, where we perhaps haven't grown up with the concept of sharing, you know, that we, we come from a different model, from a different age, um, it's very important, we think, in the Siebel Hub, that this gets rooted in our psyche quickly, because we need to build that community. The, the, we, I'm not, I sound like an advocate for open source, but it's not really that, is that perhaps the Siebel Hub is better placed to realize that if we don't talk to each other, very soon we're going to find ourselves alone in an elevator, one, you know, in 20 years. So um, <laughs> talking to ourselves, which is not something you want to do. Um, George, as always, your time has been immensely useful. So thank you very much for coming to see us. I hope, based on what he just said, that we will get a chance to meet again in one of the roadshows um, and maybe catch up again, you know, at a quarterly basis, because I think it would be really useful for everybody to know. Again, even I would love to send you to every big city in the world, George, because that would give you an opportunity to follow. But um, these kind of conversations, yeah. trust me, the readers of the Siebel Hub really appreciate it. And we appreciate very much what you and Alex and Bruce have done. With, uh, as you said, we are a community, mm. uh, and perhaps we haven't been, uh, we haven't put enough effort into that. Uh, but including your comment about open source, with, and in particular, very, very pointedly with open UI, mm. um, we within the Siebel community have really realized that uh, uh, it's, it is a huge leverage uh, to use open source software, with, as we did with jQuery with open UI, uh, but also to create this community. So the roadshows are definitely more evidence of that, and we very much appreciate uh, what you're doing at Siebel Hub to keep the community engaged. So Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thank See you, you next year. <laughs>